With infinite joy, I see many sisters of the international Gnostic movement gathered here. Certainly, the female element, duly organized, could not be missing in this great event with worldwide repercussions. The woman is the eternal love that flows and beats in everything that is, in everything that has been and in everything that will be. The pyramids of Egypt were never without a woman, since she was the vessel that initiated the great masters. The temple of Delphi was never without a woman. We will seem to see her seated in the form of the Pythoness, back in the country of Greece. She predicted great events that would inevitably take place. I am reminded of the case of Alexander the Great, the great conqueror of the world, the one who united Europe and Asia under his scepter in the form of a great empire. Let us remember the Gordian knot, Mani Pythoness of Delphi, in a state of ecstasy, challenged the wisest men to untie that knot. None could. There was only one, who was Alexander the Great. He approached that knot, drew his sword and cut it into pieces. The Delphic priestesses embraced him saying, you will conquer the world, and certainly Alexander the Great conquered it. See how throughout time the woman has guided the course of the centuries. In the ancient Egypt of the pharaohs, the woman, become Cleopatra, taught the crowds. The Cleopatras of the Elephantine Island in the Nile made their words resound before the fire to teach the people. Let us remember the woman become a priestess. A mummy of one was found many years ago and brought to the Western world. She was put into that great giant ship which exited many years ago, a huge ship and with great pain that ship went to the bottom of the sea. Unquestionably, that mummy possessed extraordinary powers, as great as those possessed by the women of the Elephantine Island, as formidable as those possessed by the Pythonesses of Delphi, as Solomon as those powers possessed by the Druid priestesses. So, throughout the centuries, the woman has shone beautifully, the eternal feminine seats and throbs in everything that is, in everything that has been, and in everything that will be. The great Alaya of the universe shines in each precious stone, in each tree and in each cosmos. The eternal feminine is worshipped as Isis in the land of the pharaohs. She is worshipped as Astarte in the land of Persia. She is worshipped on the island of Crete with the grandiose name of Sibella. She is deeply revered in the Greek land under the name of Ceres. I still remember those moments in which the Greek priest taught before the stone of Ceres, brought from some distant place. I still remember the precise memory in which the priests of Ceres taught the people before the ancient gaze of the Black Virgin. The woman has shone as a goddess and as a human. She carries the Horus child in her arms. Now she sings to him deliciously in his cradle, waiting for the morrow. The woman, the eternal feminine, is a sundrable principle from the eternal masculine principle. God himself, with all of his greatness, splits asunder in order to become a woman. The word Elohim also comes into my memory. Elohim created the world. The earth was created by Elohim. The Hebrew word Elohim means goddesses and gods. Thus the word Elohim means the creator gods and goddesses of the universe. Elohim is formed from the words El masculine and Ella feminine together. Elohim is El God and Ella Goddess, a feminine word, while I'm is a masculine plural ending. Any religion where there are no goddesses is half atheist because Elohim is gods and goddesses. 
So it is absurd to suppose that only the male can reach the intimate self-realization of the being. It is incongruous to think that only men can become Christified. In the name of truth, we will say that if Elohim means goddesses and gods, then women have the same rights as men. Women can also reach Christification. They can reach as high as the male. The man can never be more than the woman, nor is the woman more than the man. If the man can incarnate the Christ in his intimate nature, the woman also has the same right. I know Christified women. I have seen them. I am friends with them. There is one who lives in all Europe. She shines due to her beauty. She has the intimate Christ inside her. She is of the Celtic race. She is a resurrected immortal lady. I know another, two of the circle of cognate humanity that operates on the different superior centers of the being. She is an immortal druid too. So the concept that only men can reach Christification is false, because God is also a goddess, a woman. In the name of truth I have to say, emphatically, that if Elohim shone through the Cleopatras of the Elephantine Island, that Elohim shone through the Vestals of Egypt and Persia, Greece, Rome, then Elohim also shines gloriously through the woman of every time and age and through the mother who cradles her child in her arms. So, in the name of the truth, I have to say that women have the same rights as men, that men are never more than women, even if they pretend to be. The universal feminine principle shines in every stone, in the singing bed of every stream, in a delicious mountain full of trees, in all of nature. The feminine principle shines in all of nature, in the bird that flies and returns to its nest to lull its children to sleep, in the fish that glides in the depths of the stormy sea among the most terrible beasts of nature. We also see the universal feminine principle even in plants, in flowers. There we find the male and female organs, in the stamens and pistils. The feminine principle shines in the stars, since they have masculine and feminine polarities together, and those rays of the eternal feminine, coming from the most distant stars, nestle in the heart of every woman who has shone with the dissolution of the ego and Christification. So, in the name of truth, we cannot help but feel admiration for the eternal feminine. God himself splits asunder, turned into a goddess, a woman nestled with his love in the heart of the solar system. The eternal feminine is the seat from which all life arises. At the dawn of the Maha Manvantara, the Logos makes chaotic matter fertile, makes the womb of the Virgin Mother of the eternal feminine shine, so that life arises among the chaos within the great womb of the universe. So. There is no reason for the woman of the Gnostic movement to feel sad or depressed, assuming that they only serve as vehicles for men who want to become Christified. Really, they have the same right and reach the same heights. If the woman is the vehicle for the man through which he can become Christified, I must also tell you, Gnostic sisters, that the man is the instrument the mediating vehicle through which each one of you can reach Christification. The columns J and B, Yakan and Boas of every temple are also present in the heart temple. The male and female columns are not too close and not too far. There is a space between them so that light can pass between them. The eternal feminine shines not only in that which has no name, not only in the universal spirit of life, not only in the stars that attract and repel each other, according to the law of polarities, but also shines within of the atom, within the ions, within the electrons, within the protons, in the most infinitesimal particles of all that vibrates and throbs in creation. The eternal feminine makes wonderful compass with the eternal masculine, to create and create again. 
The eternal feminine is God himself turned into a mother, a goddess who works intensively in this creation. The eternal feminine is the ray that awakens the sleeping consciousness of men. The time has come for each woman to raise the torch of her word with her right hand to illuminate the path of men. With deep pain I have to say that men walk the line of entropy, that is, they walk in a downward, devolutionary path. The time has come for women to extend their right hand to men to lift them up, to regenerate them, to make something distinct out of them, something different. The time has come for women to comprehend that in these times the masculine element is in devolution. The time has come for women to fight intensively to regenerate men. Thus, women have a great role to play in this age of Aquarius, which is to regenerate the decadent masculine element. In the name of the truth, I have to say that love is the foundation of the intimate self-realization of the being. A perfect marriage is the union of two beings, one who loves more, another who loves better. Love is the best religion accessible to the human species. For there to be love, there needs to be affinity of thoughts, affinity of feelings, identical concerns. The kiss comes to be, precisely, like a mystical conservation of two souls, eager to express in a sensitive way what they internally live. The sexual act becomes the consubstantiation of love in the psycho-physiological reality of our nature. Love in itself is an outpouring, an energetic emanation from the depths that we have inside in our consciousness. Observe, for example, an old man in love. Those forces that flow from the intimate depths make the endocrine glands of the entire organism vibrate intensively, and these intensify their hormonal production. Such hormones circulate through the blood, vitalizing the entire physical body. Thus, the old man regenerates, rejuvenates, vitality shines in him. Obviously, love is great in itself. To love, how great is it to love? Only great souls can and know how to love. For there to be love, there needs to be absolute affinity of feeling. Love in itself is the height of wisdom. Love cannot be defined, because then it is disfigured. In the lands of the East, monuments are never raised to heroes, to men, but to women who know how to love. The Eternal Feminine is worshipped with various Eastern names. She is the Hindu Shakti. She is the Divine Mother Kundalini. She is precisely the Word in its universal feminine aspect. In the East, love is appreciated more, much more than merely intellectual theories. The priestesses of Japan, the women of love, were never desecrated there. They were considered very sacred. In the world of ancient Greece, the Vestals were always respected by all men, because truly, they themselves were the priestesses of love. God, in his feminine aspect, is the adorable Isis, the chaste Diana, and is also the great Alaya of the universe. God, as the feminine aspect of himself, is the womb of all this creation. Indeed, the worlds would never have emerged from the chaos from the great Alaya, if previously the Eternal Feminine had not existed. The Goddess Mother, the Universal Womb, shines deep among the chaos. The woman, in herself, has all the powers and attributes of the Divine. The woman, in herself, must help the man. The time has come to understand the state of the transcendent and transcendental receptivity that women possess, namely, that intuition, that capacity that she has to perceive the truth directly for herself and without so many theories. The time has come to understand that next to column J is column B. The time has come to understand that, within the atom, the masculine and feminine principles, ions and electrons are organised and agitated intensively. The eternal feminine, the goddess mother, is the soul of the universe. As Plato said, 
She is the Anima Mundi, crucified on the planet Earth. The Midnight Sun lives in love with the woman. The Midnight Sun, the Logos, loves the woman. She is Urania Venus, the one who has the Book of Wisdom in her hands. She is precisely the vessel that is between the two columns in the Egyptian temple. She is the wife of the third Logos. Comprehending these principles, we the men must revere women, worship women, because without women we could not reach the intimate self-realization of the being. The feminine yoni is represented by the Holy Grail, by the cup of Hermes and Solomon. It is this delicious chalice from which Christ drank at the Last Supper. With great joy, I am inaugurating today, 1976, precisely the Female Gnostic Congress. It is with great joy that I begin the August works of these beloved ladies. Certainly, in this era of the water carrier, women have a specific, defined mission to fulfill. In the name of truth, we will say that women, those of holy predestination, can lift men towards the regions of the light. It is through the substance of love that the women can redeem men, how she illuminates and leads her man to integral transformation. The woman, the eternal feminine, envelops the entire planet with her glances of light. She, the ineffable, she, always representing the maternal principle, helps her man and leads him wisely to his own self-realization. The woman, as a mother, raises her children. She gives them food. She clothes them. She nourishes them with her wise advice. She, as a maternal principle, representing the eternal feminine, leads them to the age of maturity. Much later in time, when we remember our eternal little mother, the eternal feminine who helped us so much, we can only prostrate ourselves on the ground to adore the mother goddess of the world. If she has the power to form a child in her womb, if she has power to bring him into existence and nourish him and raise him up, if she has the power to transform her husband spiritually through sexual regeneration, she also has the power to cooperate in the great cause, to help the Gnostic Church and the Gnostic movement in general in a loving manner. One is filled with joy when contemplating these beautiful ladies working feverishly to help humanity. One is filled with joy when seeing them making us host bread or making us the Eucharist wine with the sole intention of helping the solar Logos in his feverish work with nature. Love is what is fundamental and the woman is love. Love is wisdom and in the woman shines the brilliance of love and the sacred fire of wisdom. Thus we expect from women an increasingly intense work with the purpose of making the Gnostic Congress a great event. We expect the best cooperation from women so that the Holy Gnostic Church can shine blazingly throughout the universe. The woman, whether we symbolize her with the chaste Diana, or that we represent her with the beautiful Helen of Troy, or with the Gioconda of Leonardo da Vinci is the fundamental cause of all our longings. Within her is the basic impulse that can lead us to regeneration, and in her is the wonderful force that can transform us and make us true Elohim in the most transcendental sense of the word. She, whether we call her Minerva as wisdom or Isis as love, the truth is that she encloses within herself the manna of the desert with which the holy gods are fed. Blessed women, in the flame of the brazen serpent of the nocturnal and profound sky of the desert we invoke thee. Blessed woman, without thee we men are worthless. May peace be with you, ineffable women. Samael on Vior has spoken for you. Inverential peace.